in this uh, in the heat of this crisis on all of you as healthcare professionals uh, experiencing at first line. It is even more evident how important education is and how important staying connected in an educational experience is. Thank you all for joining today. Uh, we have 118 people registered, which certainly speaks to uh, the need and the and the interest in this. Thank you. Um, I'm Marge Albom with OSER Americas. We have had a relationship with the AMSSM as an elite sponsor for over nine years. And this is evidence of our continued relationship and commitment to that in producing this first um, online educational symposium for an external audience. Thank you all for being here. I'm going to introduce uh, both of our speakers, uh, Dr. Mountner and Dr. Alberto Panero, um, together at once, and then we will go into the presentations. Dr. Mountner will start, Dr. Panero will uh, be second. We will hold the Q&A options until the end of the presentations. At that time, the Q&A function will be, um, will be activated and you can type your questions there. And then we will entertain the questions in Q&A and discussion following the presentations. We also have uh, two OSER representatives on, on, on the webinar, uh, Scott Campbell and Wade Bennett, and they're available to answer any technical questions or any product questions and available with some information for you also as the discussion continues. I'll now introduce our two speakers. Our thanks to both of them for being flexible, available, and uh, very enthusiastic about this format. Dr. Ken Mountner is an associate professor in the Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation and the Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. He is board certified in PMNR with a subspecialty certification in sports medicine. He is the director of sports medicine at Emory and fellowship director for the ACGME accredited sports medicine fellowship. Dr. Mountner is co-editor of the Atlas of Interventional Musculoskeletal Ultrasound, as well as a, a, a considered a leader in the field of ultrasound and orthobiologic treatment for chronic soft tissue and joint disorders. He has published numerous studies in these areas with ongoing clinical trials. Dr. Mountner serves as head team physician for the Atlanta Hawks, medical director for the Harlem Globetrotters, as well as team physician for the Atlanta Braves, Emory University, and Georgia Tech. Dr. Alberto Panero is board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation with a subspecialty certification in sports medicine. He is founder of SAC Regenerative Orthopedics, where he practices out of Sacramento, California. He serves as core faculty for the University of California, Davis, PM&R Sports Medicine Fellowship. He is regarded as one of the forerunners in orthobiologics and musculoskeletal ultrasound, having published on several respective topics <clears throat> and presented his research at various orthopedic and sports medicine conferences nationwide. Dr. Panero is highly involved in the sports medicine community in Sacramento, serving as team physician for, the, for Sacramento State University, Sacramento Rivercats, AAA affiliate of the San Francisco Giants, as well as the recently awarded MLS expansion team, the Sacramento Republic. Thank you both doctors for being our presenters and I'll turn it over now to Dr. Mountner. So I'm gonna go ahead and get started here. Um, hopefully everyone can hear me and can see my screen um, and probably not see me anymore. Um, so I'm gonna talk for the first 20 to 25 minutes. And then after that, um, Dr. Panera will talk as well. And then we'll have Q&A at the end. And so, I'd like to thank uh, OSER as well as um, uh, AMSSM for putting this together as well. Um, here are my disclosures uh, for the talk, um, although not really relevant to what I'll be talking about today. Um, so I'd like to start with a quote, which I often do, um, given at a Harvard uh, faculty, um, given at a Har Harvard uh, graduation um, years ago, half of what we're going to teach you is wrong and half is right. Um, our problem is that we don't know which half is which. and Unfortunately, I think that is still true of, of orthobiologics to some degree, which is mainly what I'm going to be talking about today, um, trying to figure out what's fact and, and what's fiction and how today's fact may be tomorrow's fiction and, and vice versa. So a little uh, overview, you know, what is the optimal treatment of osteoarthritis pain? You know, where are we uh, today? Um, 
this article actually from uh, several years ago, uh, maybe eight to nine years ago. Um, it looks at treatment for osteoarthritis. Um, and if you look at the bottom right, this is really what ideal treatment should be, an ideal combination of, of things that are cost effective and things that are kind of low cost. Um, and we don't have a whole lot that, that fit into that gap. And so, um, you know, TKA, uh, total knee arthroplasty, obviously is an effective treatment, um, but comes at a, at a very high cost. Um, and then certain things here, which may be less effective um, as well. And the problem with total knee arthroplasty is that if you look at the literature out there, there's about a 20% regret rate, meaning 20% of patients for one reason or another, you know, wish they did not have the surgery. Um, once again, this is old data, so I think these numbers are probably bigger now, but if you look at this treatment gap that people often talk about with osteoarthritis, um, there's a certain number of folks who manage their osteoarthritis successfully uh, with um, medications and bracing and anti-inflammatories um, and, and kind of uh, activity modification. And then there's a small percentage that get a total arthroplasty every year but there was this treatment gap, and that treatment gap um, may have up to 3.6 million people, probably more now, who either are unwilling or unable uh, to undergo knee arthroplasty who do not um, get sufficient uh, relief of pain with the conservative current treatment that are available out there. And people actually live in this treatment gap for a number of years, you know, 20 years or, or, or longer sometimes, um, and they really can be miserable. And so um what are our options for these folks right i mean we talk a lot about corticosteroid injections i won't belabor this point here but there's plenty of evidence out there showing that steroid injections um, are really effective for the short term this study a meta-analysis looked at steroid injections and showed after about a week patient has significantly less pain um and and better and less and better function uh, but by three to four weeks their pain scores was not statistically better than it was they didn't get steroid injections and by six to eight weeks, their pain and function were back to normal. So very short-term relief. In addition, we now know that uh, steroids offer dose-dependent toxicity to joints. And so um, just injecting them themselves not only do not provide long-term effect, but may provide long-term detriment to the joint. And in fact, this study uh, showed over a two-year period, patients injected with either saline or corticosteroids not only did they show uh, more degradation of their cartilage in the steroid group when they got injected um, every three months for two years, but they also showed that there was no difference in their pain and function. So the saline group did just as well from a pain point of view, um, statistically speaking, as the uh, corticosteroid group did. And not only that, but most of us know that the lidocaine um, and intraarticular um, anesthetics that we use are also toxic to the cartilage as well. So I don't think anyone would argue that at this point, you know, there's a need for safe, clinically effective, cost-conscious, minimally invasive treatment options to reduce pain and improve function in musculoskeletal conditions. So uh, PRP, I'm sure most people have heard about PRP, and, and you know, I'm going to talk a little bit about PRP and stem cell. My experience is here. Um, this term has been around since the 70s, and basically PRP was described as plasma with a platelet count above that of peripheral blood. So anytime you're concentrating blood and, and getting the platelets to any degree um, above your baseline, you are creating a platelet-rich plasma. And you can kind of see in orthopedic and sports medicine, um, it really was about 15 years ago when we started having some use of, of PRP in our clinics. So PRP contain alpha gran or platelets contain alpha granules, which uh, contain these growth factor, which aid in the healing response. And so this is how we think, um, especially for soft tissue injuries, how PRP may help heal these tissues. So what is the role of platelet-rich plasma for osteoarthritis? Well, so we need to think about arthritis um, in a cytokine um, driven uh, uh, mechanism as opposed to just inflammation um, and bone spurs and loss of cartilage. These processes are driven by these uh, down regulation of a lot of these growth factors and interleukins um, that are in our body. And so the idea is that if we have this down regulation of these products, which create this loop of osteoarthritis and we inject the cellular product and we can then increase these growth factors um, increase something called IL-1-RA, which is kind of the anti-arthritis interleukin, and, and, I've, and create a more homeostatic, uh, sorry, create a better homeostasis inside the joints. So does PRP work for arth arthritis? Well, it's difficult to compare studies, um, different types of PRP, everyone's PRP is different, underlying arthritis is different as well, 
uh, different injection protocols, um, which are you know very varied out there, different rehab protocols. So what did the research say? Well, this was an interesting review, 2018, JBJS, um, a network meta-analysis. It looked at a whole bunch of different studies on uh, PRP, uh, sorry, a whole bunch of different studies on multiple um, conservative treatments for osteoarthritis pain of the knee. And so with these 10 studies, it looks at all these different treatments from Tylenol, glucosamine, um, you know, PRP, hyaluronic acid, heel wedges, um, TENS unit, uh, bracing, all these things. And what they found was of everything they looked at, PRP did seem to provide the greatest treatment effect, um, but they did acknowledge a lot of variability amongst the studies. So three studies have come out, um, well, actually more than three, but there have been a lot of um, meta-analyses comparing PRP to hyaluronic acid and a lot of randomized trial as well. And over the last few years, almost universally, uh, these studies have suggested that PRP uh, works better than hyaluronic acid injections uh, for treating the osteoarthritis. Um, the clinical improvements seem to last up to about 12 months and the benefits seem to be better in younger patients and earlier in the arthritic process. All important points to note. So how about different types of PRP? Um, this has been looked at by uh, Brian Cole and, and uh, his group uh, out of Chicago. Um, they, they looked at about 10 studies that, that had either leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor PRP injected. They weren't head to head studies. Um, and what they found is that leukocyte poor PRP, meaning reducing the white blood cell, uh, especially neutrophils, as well as reducing the red blood cells um, in the PRP, uh, seem to lead to better outcomes compared to leukocyte-rich PRP. So I know we're talking mostly about the knee today, and that's where the overwhelming evidence is. However, um, there are studies on hip and ankle that have shown improvement in pain and function, um, but not much evidence in, in smaller joints. It just hasn't been a lot of studies published in smaller joints outside the knee, hip, ankle, and a little bit in the shoulder. So bottom line here, PRP does not grow new cartilage. It can't reverse changes in the bony architecture. Um, in theory, it can delay the progression of arthritis uh, by, by getting a healthier joint that's less inflamed and, and irritated. It's difficult to treat non-surgically after bony changes have occurred. So once again, ideally, we treat earlier versus later. Studies indicate efficacy around 12 months. So this is not a one and you're done kind of treatment. You'll probably be coming back for additional treatments in the future. So I'm going to move on to kind of uh, stem cell, which uh, I put in quotation marks, and I'll, I'll mention why that is in a minute. But, you know, this is not a new uh, technology we've been using. The, the fountain of youth, it, youth is something we've been looking for for years. Um, back in the 70s, they were doing these uh, uh, experiments on, on mice uh, called uh, parabiosis, where they were actually um, suturing mice together. Um, and when they sutured them together, their blood supplies were actually intertwined and, and intermingled. Um, and what they found is that the older mice actually took on the characteristics of the younger mice, meaning its hair got shinier, its teeth were healthier, um, and its cartilage appeared younger. And so we've known for a while that injecting younger cells, um, or I should say uh, healthy cells into a person, um, or into a mice, I should say, um, can in fact lead to uh, some reversal of the aging process. So, you know, in medical school, when we learned about what a stem cell is, um, we, we were learning about um, um, different uh, multiple, sorry, we were talking about stem cells differentiating into different cells and how the stem cells have the ability to self-replicate. What really wasn't discussed where is the fact that stem cells do have an ability to reduce inflammation um, and fight cell death. And so when we're talking about these these cells, these mesenchymal stem cells, we really are focusing on the trophic effects, um, which are not self-replicating, but are um, differentiating, um, inhibiting apoptosis, suppressing inflammation, and, and having a supportive function along the joint. And so in fact, you know, Arnold Kaplan, who is the father of mesenchymal stem cells and actually coined that term, um, has over the last couple of years been going around and, and, and trying to recoin it and call these medicinal signaling cells. Um, and so I try my best to call this cellular medicine or MSC injections um, and get away from that term stem cell, which really implies something that is not occurring. So different types of stem cells um, injectable for arthritis. Um, most of what I do and then what I'm going to talk about is autologous products. Um, Dr. Panera will talk about the allergenic products. 
the things you see in red are actually um, not FDA approved. So we can't culture and expand cells. We can't use thermovascular diffraction. Um, we can do these things which, with permission from the FDA if we get something called an IND. But the things that we typically uh, do in this country are bone marrow aspirate, bone marrow concentrate, and the lipo aspirate, either in the form of a fat graft or a microfragmented um, adipose tissue. So if you look at MSCs um, and you read the media reports and all of the you know bloggers out there, um, they talk about how this is unsafe and unproven and they, they, they repeatedly harp on unsafe and unproven over and over and over again. So, so let me dive into that for a couple minutes here. And so in terms of unsafe, there have been a couple of large uh, case series out there looking at um, this with 3,000 patients who had bone marrow procedures done. Um, and although there were 10% reported some kind of adverse event, the majority of these were just pain related to the procedure or pain related to their arthritis. And in fact, uh, there were no major complications reported um, and only seven uh, neoplasms in this population, which is actually a lower rate than you would expect in, in the general population. Um, Philip Hernigou, um presented similar kind of data. He had a 12.5 year follow-up time. He looked at MRI images of the area he injected and found once again, no tumor formation seen at all um, at all of these x-rays and MRIs that were done and 53 cancer diagnosed over that period of time, which was about half as which you would expect in the general population during that time. And so by removing autologously someone's cells and transferring them to another part of the body, without culture or expansion, we've not seen any uh, um, unsafe effects of this. Um, this has been looked at with adipose, this has been looked at with culture and expanded cells, and once again, they've been shown to be very, very safe. So how about unproven? Um, I won't go through all the evidence in my short time I have, so this is kind of my you know 30,000 uh, foot view here of the unprovenness, and so, there's high quality level one evidence for bone marrow concentration for pre-collapsed avascular necrosis. And this is mostly due to Dr. Hernigou's work um, that we can reverse and cure pre-collapsed AVN with intra-articular, sorry, with intraosseous injection of, of uh, uh, bone marrow concentrate. Um, you know, knee osteoarthritis, um, there are a lot of case reports and case series as well that are favorable. Um, there's not a lot of evidence for regeneration inside of these joints. Um, there is some evidence in some of the culture and expanded work that we can see regeneration, which is still only about 20%. In the non-culture expanded world, there are some case reports and some really small case series showing regeneration, but realize um, the evidence out there suggests secretory pathways and not differentiation is the way that these treatments are working. And once again, I'll let Dr. Panera talk about the birth tissues. So what are the optimal source of cells for arthritis? This is a big interest of mine. Um, you know, fabric, sorry, if you look around the country, around the world, um, you know, bone marrow um, and adipose are the two things being used the most. Uh, cartilage um, surgically is, is being used as well, not so much for what we do injection wise. So there's been a lot of studies on fat versus bone marrow, but, but no studies have actually compared clinical outcomes in bone marrow versus adipose derived uh, MSCs. So we published this last year. Um, we have a, a prospective uh, a, um, co two cohorts of patients who were treated with either adipose or bone marrow, and we wanted to know their outcome. Pretty simple study we put together. It was not randomized, but it was prospective. Um, in the end, we had 76 patients with appropriate follow-up data um, at least six months out. And you can see the average was between one and 1 1.8 years out from the procedure. So real quickly, if you look at my technique, um, I, I don't worry about the volume. I, I don't know how to turn that down, but basically you can see my technique here for bone marrow and we're kind of tapping to the bone here a little bit. Um, and as we turn, we put our syringe on here and we take these small quick draws. We go to a few different spots. We get multiple samples. Uh, these quick draws, small syringes tend to be a, a good way to try to preferentially uh, obtain MSCs and, and less so um, the peripheral blood, which is an issue with, with bone marrow aspiration sometimes. Um, same thing with our lipo aspirate that we use. We use microfragmented tissue. Um, we usually go into their flank or their stomach area. We do um, uh, collect a, a certain amount. And then we put it through these filters. We use these ball bearings. We kind of shake it up. We, we, we reshape it. We resize it. We rinse it. 
Um, and then we put them through these filters again to kind of um, hopefully help release uh, some of these uh, parasites and MSCs um, in the product. And you'll see that process going on really quickly. And then the injection, um, or at least the injectate that we're left with. And typically for a knee, we inject, you know, 9 cc is a microfragmented uh, tissue here. So what were our results? So if you looked at all comers, uh, statistically, both the BMAC and the lipogens group, our, our MFAC group has statistically a uh, significant reduction in pain. There was no difference between the two groups. Um, but we went further and said, well, you know, there's going to be a certain amount of folks here are non-responders. And so we looked at the folks who responded and had at least a 25% improvement in their pain score. So they had some response to the injection. And if you looked at those patients, we actually found a combined 73% reduction in the pain scores um, in the two groups. Once again, statistically, um, there wasn't a difference between the two groups in their pain reduction, but very significant for those who responded. So then we looked at it, well, who responds? And if you look at the degree of arthritis they have, we found that those who have milder arthritis, grades one and two, KL grade, were much more likely to respond than grade three and four. And so the grade three and four, it was really about 50-50 response rates um, in our patients in this uh, objective database. So our, our conclusion, significant improvement in pain and function with MFAT or BMAC um, at greater than one year out without a significant difference between the treatment modalities. Um, so real quick, this leads to our next study, which is ongoing here at Emory. It's the $13 million sponsor study by, by the Marcus Foundation. And now we're looking at four different, uh, it's a multi-center study looking at four different types of injectables. So we can really start to see you know, which of these injections have the most efficacy. And so this is a single blinded study. We're looking at 480 patients with unilateral knee arthritis, age 30 to 70. We have 12 month follow-up with patient reported outcomes. We have MRIs at three points in time. We have knee x-rays all beforehand as well. Um, we have complete cellular analysis um, of the injectate as well as a joint aspirate. So we can, we can evaluate the joint environment and we will completely analyze um, what we're going to actually inject. And what we're going to inject is it's a three-arm study. Each arm has a sham procedure in some patients. So arm one will, 160 patients will have their bone marrow aspirated, and 120 will get bone marrow concentrate injected. 40 will just get a steroid injection. Same for arm two with SVF. We have an IND for our SVF for this study. And arm three is just a third-party umbilical cord tissue product that is manufactured at Duke. It's not a commercial product. Um, and once again, patient will be blinded to get either the umbilical cord tissue or steroid injection. So, you know, we're about halfway through enrollment in the study. We're really excited about it. So I'd just like to present that to kind of stay tuned because we still have a long way to go. But this is uh, hopefully going to be a very uh, a groundbreaking study when, when we have our results out there. So uh, take home points, um, you know, there's a minimally invasive, um, there's a need for minimally invasive treatment option with those who suffer in this treatment gap of knee osteoarthritis. And I think many of us on this call um, feel an urge to, to help treat these patients. Um, we need to better understand the trophic and secretory effects of MSCs, uh, the difference in the mechanism of action of MSCs, um, and how to translate what we do in the lab to what we do in the clinical practice setting. And there's still a lot we don't know. Um, we don't know the best source of cells. We don't know what dose is better. Um, we don't know the best route of delivery. And, and we certainly haven't done a lot of studies looking at the rehabilitation effects on, on, on knees or, or other areas as well. So my last slide here talks about, you know, why is cellular medicine being held to a higher standard? And so if you want to read an interesting article by Arnold Kaplan um, in 2018 called The Non-Responder. And so basically, um, if you look through history, any drug out there has non-responders. You know, NSAIDs only have the 60% response rate. You know, HIV, we're thrilled with the 30 to 40% response rate. You know, we, we know the annual flu vaccine only, um, only you know, helps about 20% of people or so who get it. Um, and so 30 to 60% of folks, you know, may have non-response to a biologic injection. And it could be because of the, the host, meaning the joint we're injecting into, or it could be because we haven't optimized our MSC injection. Um, and so these are things we need to work on. And hopefully we get to the point with precision medicine where we can find out what injection is best for what host. Uh, but realize that, that just because we have a non-response rate does not mean, in my opinion, that we shouldn't be doing these treatments. 
And in fact, on our Arnold Kaplan proposal that for phase three studies, we should actually use the non-responders as our placebo control um, because they're getting the drug that we don't know that they're a non-responder, neither do they. Um, and they could actually be our control and actually maybe these can help products get out to market even faster. So just something interesting to think about at the end. Um, and thanks for everyone's time and attention. I'm gonna end my talk. All right. Thanks, Dr. Manor, for such a great talk. Um, I do gotta give you your props because you know you've always been a, a positive influence on me since I did a rotation with you back like 12 years ago at Emory. So I gotta give you that respect. Good morning, everybody. My name is Alberto Pinero. PMNR sports medicine physician from Sacramento, California. Couldn't be more excited to be here with y'all. Uh, I'm gonna continue our orthobiologic session. I wanna thank OSER and AMSSM for having me today, as well as Dr. Ken Mountner for letting me share the virtual stage with him. I do have a few disclosures. These are my objectives for today. Primarily, we're gonna review the science behind allograft injection options, uh, go over some placental derived tissue science, exosomes and culture derived cells. We're also going to discuss the role of interventional orthopedics in NEOA. And we're going to finish out by addressing some biomechanical factors. So let's just get to it. So allograft tissues provide an interesting proposition. If a patient has a lot of systemic comorbidities, uh, you may not want to use their own autologous tissues, for instance, PRP or bone marrow in a patient that uh, has uncontrolled diabetes, maybe on chronic uh, prednisone therapy or have autoimmune disease, may not really be uh, the right thing to do. Also, even though harvesting complications are low with microfat uh, harvesting or even bone marrow, they can still happen and you would avoid all of these by using analographs. And more importantly, you have the potential to get a standardized quantity of cells or growth factors and therefore you may be able to dose for a specific pathology, a certain amount of growth factor uh, in your injection. Uh, so that would be actually quite a big benefit since every patient will have uh, some sort of difference within their autologous tissues. We know that in vivo, uh, amniotic fluid contains mesenchymal stem cells. And this has been proven in the basic science data. Uh, these were two studies that I, that I quoted here but notice that one was doing immediately following a live birth and second during uh, a second trimester amniocentesis. So our question was, how does this translate to commercial products? We know that they're there in vivo, but once these tissues get processed, will, they still, will the cells still be there? That's what led to our study that was published in AJSM uh, last year. Please go ahead and check it out. I'm gonna go ahead and, and review it briefly. We started by going over to the UC Davis Center for Regenerative Cures and came up with a protocol to test amniotic fluid samples. We reached out to the community and had three companies uh, agree to participate and donate tissues. We started with the palingen graft, uh, the flow graft, and the genesis, which is an acellular particle free graft. And we knew we had to have some comparisons and controls. So we reached out to UC Davis and got unprocessed amniotic fluid. And we know we're really good at growing uh, mesenchymal cells in culture from bone marrow. And we felt like that would be a really good control as well. So the first thing we did is we thawed these, these products out and we looked at them on their face uh, contrast microscopy. Uh, we used tripane blue exclusion diet to see if there was you know, cells, number one, and were they alive or dead. And the results were somewhat um, interesting. So notice for the flow graft, uh, there was about 50% viability. So we were able to find some cells. Uh, having said that, uh, it's hard to say on this graft, but the, the amount of cells we actually found was quite low. And notice on flow graft sample one, 50% of them were alive, 50% of them were dead. Flow graft two, they were all dead. And flow graft sample three had no cells at all. Similar findings with palingen, which each sample had a different uh, amount of cells with uh, about 50% viability. And the genesis was true to its name uh, and was a cellular. Okay, so we did find some cells, but the real question were, was, are these actually mesenchymal stem cells? So that was the next part of our experiment. And this is a little bit um, past the scope of this study, but the, me the term mesenchymal stem cell has undergone uh, multiple variations. Uh, right now, we're playing more with medicinal signaling 
signaling cell than mesenchymal stem cell, just because it may not keep its stem uh, capability. For our experiment, we wanted to stick to the traditional definition and our MSC had to be plastic adherent. It had to be double negative and triple positive for these factors. And it had to be capable of osteogenic, adipogenic, and chondrogenic differentiation. So what we did is we grabbed those same products as, as well as the bone marrow and the unprocessed amniotic fluid. We plated it in MSC culture medium and we expanded it out for 28 days. And this was done uh, independently at UC Davis. So after the 28 days, uh, we try and grow these out. Uh, once we stained them, we could not find any, any uh, colony forming units in any of the amniotic fluid samples, which was uh, you know, somewhat surprising and, and obviously disappointing. Uh, we wanted to do flow cytometry on these cells, but since we couldn't find any cells, we couldn't run that part of the experiment. On the other hand, when we looked at bone marrow doing the same exact procedure, you can see how many colony forming units were formed in each sample. So noting that our actual methods uh, were done correctly and it's just that there weren't any cells and at least in the samples that we tested. So then we said, well, there may not be any cells, but is there something to these allograft products and could they be of, of any benefit? Well, when we look at PRP and bone marrow concentrate, we know that although the cells are important, a lot of the regenerative uh, properties may be mediated through these growth factors. And when you look at PRP and bone marrow, you have large quantities of these growth factors. So we said, well, could there be that these products contain these same growth factors? So we randomized them for those same growth factors. As you can see on the top left, only one, the palingen tested positive for platelet-derived growth factor beta, as well as the unprocessed amniotic fluid. BMP was positive all across the board, was ILA, was very low, except for the unprocessed amniotic fluid and similar findings with VEGF and TGF beta 1. What I want you guys to take notice is that the unprocessed amniotic fluid tested quite high for most of these growth factors, uh, which means that not only are we losing the cells with the commercial preparations or the processing, but we may also be doing something that's lowering the growth factor content in those commercial products as well. So we have to do a better job of, of processing it. So in conclusion, Currently, these regenerative allografts uh, should not be considered stem cell therapies, but they may present a viable option down the road due to their growth factor and cytokine content. Okay, let's move on to some other regenerative allografts option. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about exosomes. So what are exosomes? The way I understand them is essentially it's the message. So when a cell wants to communicate with another cell to tell it what to do or what to become, uh, it will essentially come up with this exosome and it will package its message and it'll send it out. The recipient cell will then uh, ingest that exosome and then it will tell it to create a certain protein or release a certain growth factor. So the idea here is that if we can ext extract the exosome or extract the message and concentrate it and tell another cell what to become, you're essentially removing the, the cell itself and just being able to communicate the message directly. Now, this is really cool technology, and I think it may be promising down the road, but right now, we really don't have the right technology, one, to know exactly which exosome is going to do what, two, uh, a proper way of extracting these exosomes in quantifiable uh, numbers and doing it the same way between patient and patient, uh, and thirdly, uh, to be able to re-inject it in a way that will make it do what we want it to do. And the FDA has come down hard on this. So they, in December of last year, they released essentially a public safety notice, essentially saying these are not FDA approved and they should be avoided. Uh, so essentially, um, my recommendation right now would be not to use these products. Now I want to talk a little about cellular expansion because I think this is where the big difference is. Uh, and I have Joe Rogan up here. So I love his podcast. And he talks a lot about, you know, clinics outside of the U.S. and doing using placental derived tissues and other allograft tissues. Now, the big difference is that in other countries, you can actually isolate the stem cell and then you can grow it or expand it in culture. And then you can get, you know, millions of cells or thousands of cells, how many you want, and re-inject it into the patient. So that's why they're able to do those things in other countries. But in the U.S., the FDA does not allow us to do that. So when you talk about U.S. commercial products or allograft, whether it's placental derived, whether it's exosomes, these products are not culture expanded and therefore uh, very low 
and if they have any cells at all. Now, when we do look at uh, culture expanded, bone marrow and adipose tissue obviously has really good trilineage differentiation. Um, but out of the placental derived, it seems that Wharton's jelly seems to have the best trilineage differentiation. So that means it can differentiate well into uh, chondrogenic tissues, adipogenic, and osteogenic tissues. And as you see on the chart, as we go down to different tissues, they have varying degrees of that. So it would seem that Wharton's jelly is a good source of MSCs when you're able to culture expand them. But again, not to keep harping on this, that is not allowed here in the FDA. This was a guidance document uh, from November of 2017. And you got to make sure that the product is minimally manipulated, that it's intended for homologous use, and it, that it doesn't involve the combination of cells or tissues with another article. So this uh, gave these companies a three-year grace period that's going to be uh, essentially times up uh, th this November 2020. And a lot of these products, unless they can show uh, good data, they're going to be pushed towards the medication pathway instead of the cells and tissues pathway. Uh, and we'll have to uh, essentially be regulated differently, and we may not be able to use them anymore if you're doing that now. Okay, I'm going to switch uh, topics now more into the clinical part. Um, that was a lot of basic science. So where does interventional orthopedics come in? Well, I think that this is a very exciting um, sub part of sports medicine or even um, AMSSM, I think, uh, will have a lot more coming in terms of procedures that we can do. Uh, but obviously, we're going to need a lot more training and we're going to need partnerships with our orthopedic colleagues to get better at these. So I think it comes down to how can we get better? Uh, interventional orthopedics means how can we improve time to diagnoses? How can we better identify at-risk populations? In a fit, in an attempt to fix some of these problems um, interventionally before they get to the end stage. Well, one interesting technology is needle arthroscopy, and there's several companies that are doing this now. I think this is early in the game right now, but this will might be able to help us, uh, especially down the road once we can get better at it. For instance, I had a patient who's a 38-year-old female. She had medial posterior knee pain for about six months. Uh, no trauma. Clinical exam was relatively equivocal. I couldn't make her hurt uh, when I was uh, examining her. She had a normal x-ray, normal MRI. She had failed multiple conservative treatments. I had her see one of my orthopedic colleagues, and he didn't recommend surgery. So this would have been a patient we would have just said, well, continue doing your rehab and, and see what happens. I decided to go ahead and do a needle arthroscopy, and even though the MRI was normal, we did find um, fraying of the meniscus possible tear there and some injury to the uh, femoral condyle. So this was a patient that I went from essentially wanting to say, hey, there's nothing I can do for you uh, to someone. Then I pushed to try some orthobiologic injections uh, and she actually did well. And now I'm going to wait a few months and do a second look and see if anything changed. Uh, whether it did or not, I don't know. Uh, but again, uh, an example on how better visualization can lead to better treatment early of these patients. The next thing is looking at what lies below. So cartilage re receives a lot of the attention and, and rightfully so, it's, it's a lot of the problem. But I think a lot of times we forget that there's something going on with the subchondral bone that li likely needs to be addressed as well. So what are the things we see? Well, one is bone marrow edema. We can also see subchondral cysts, uh, insufficiency fractures, acute avascular necrosis, and even osteoarthritis. So when we look at it histologically, we see that these bone marrow lesions have microcracks and fractures, fibrosis, essentially non-union characteristics. And what comes with that is increased intraosseous pressure, which can correlate with pain even in the absence of arthritic changes. And as you can see, when you have osteonecrosis, uh, it'll increase your intraosseous pressure from, six, uh, from 30 to 60 uh, mill uh, millimeters of mercury compared to an arthritic knee. So you can see how much more pressure there is there. And this article I thought was very interesting, which showed that subjects who had any bone marrow edema uh, pattern were nine times as likely to progress to a total knee replacement. So you can see that there's something very significant with these subchondral lesions that uh, need to be addressed early. So one of the ways to address them is to do an intraosseous bioplasty, which is essentially a core decompression where you uh, essentially relieve the pressure and then you want to inject some sort of biologic to initiate, initiate healing or encourage bone remodeling. And you can use PRP, you can use bone marrow, and you want to mix it with uh, demineralized bone matrix. 
This was a good review of the literature uh, that uh, looked at core decompression with bone marrow concentrate. And you can see that uh, when you combine the two, it is more beneficial than doing a, a core decompressor alone. Uh, this was looked at uh, femoral head uh, avascular necrosis. You can see significant improvements in the hip hair score, decreased in the necrotic area, and decreased femoral head collapse. And Philip Hernigou also studied this, uh, looking at uh, doing this treatment for treatment of osteonecrosis of the hip. And you can see that if, he, if you got it early, uh, there was significant improvement in stage one and stage two. But if you try and treat these after the femoral head collapse, there was a significantly higher failure rate. And this was also seen in the amount of arthroplasty. So when you do these procedures early, you can actually modify the disease and um, basically prevent them from having to transition to a joint replacement. This also led to looking at doing just basic intraosseous platelet-rich plasma. Uh, so instead of doing the full core decompression, uh, just injecting intraosseous PRP in the setting of osteoarthritis. And this was uh, looked by Sanchez in 2019. They looked at 60 patients, intraarticular PRP versus intraarticular and intraosseous PRP. At two months, they did about the same, but at six and 12 months, intraosseous group had superior uh, pain and functional scores than the intraarticular alone. This was also seen uh, in this paper by Sue in 2018. They did 86 patients uh, and they compared intraarticular intraosseous uh, versus PRP alone versus hyaluronic acid. And you can see uh, the uh, blue line here how much better it did when you combined both the intraarticular and intraosseous PRP injections. And this can be done under fluoroscopy, which I think is probably the, the more accurate way. Uh, you can ensure that you stay away from uh, penetrating through the cartilage. And also you can use contrast to ensure that your flow patterns where your bone marrow edema is on the MRI. An alternative to this, and this is the technique that I'm working on, and I know Dr. Sampson uh, in SoCal is doing it as well, where you essentially find your joint line with ultrasound, uh, you guide a, a needle uh, down into the joint, and you essentially use it as a marker, and then you extrapolate about two centimeters proximal, uh, and obviously you wanna try and extrapolate from your MRI where that bone marrow edema is, and go uh, superior or posterior, I'm sorry, um, anterior or posterior, and then you can use one of these hand drills to drill into the bone, advance one to two centimeters and inject your uh, biologic there. All right, so we're gonna to move to the last part of the topic, which is addressing mechanical factors. So obviously we all know we wanna look at these things early. We wanna look at gait and running analysis, uh, physical therapy to correct some of these imbalances. Uh, we talked a little about improving the bone integrity and scaffolding, and then we'll go over some bracing. And rehab is kind of a, a hot topic in, in biologics because it's so highly variable. Uh, you know, physicians around the globe are, are kind of all over the place with this. I think my general concepts are, you know, with intraarticular injections, you're going to be uh, more liberal, uh, less conservative. Uh, you're going to likely allow them to bear weight early. No immobilization will be needed. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, considering an unloader orthosis. Uh, and as you do more biologics, when you go into tendons or intramuscular, you're likely going to change your rehab protocols a little bit. I think that the main thing is having a plan, making sure that you're doing things consistent and looking at your data and seeing where you can improve and making sure that you provide some sort of guidance, not only for the patient uh, and for the therapist as well. And this is the type of uh, handout that I'll give my patients. Now, when we talked about uh, the mechanical, using a unloader brace is probably the way to go. And I do this pretty much after every biologic injection. And obviously these are patients that have um, focal medial compartment problems or lateral compartment, and then you just switch it from a lateral to medial unloader. Um, OSAR has a really nice brace that I use quite a bit. And what we noticed was a significant improvement in the uh, scores. So this was also echoed by uh, Kirsten Oliver uh, from the Blue Tail Group. Uh, she also noticed that she was getting improvements in, in her biologic injections by having patients use an unloader brace for six weeks after the injection. Uh, so that's something that we've adopted and we've had uh, really good results with. And the reason it works is that you're essentially changing uh, the, the ground force reactor uh, vector here. 
So when you look on, on the left side of the screen at the varus knee, you can see the mechanical axis is shifted medially. So by using the loader brace, you bring that back to its natural, its normal alignment, and now the load on the knee is, is much more natural and it's not uh, collapsing the compartment. And uh, medial unloader or compart unloader compartment bracing has really good data. There's actually 22 peer-reviewed uh, studies that show significant improvements in pain uh, in function. This was another study uh, from the Stedman Philippon Research Institute just looking at the reduction in medication use. So you can see just using an unloader uh, alone, uh, they were able to reduce 25% pain medication, 31% uh, anti-inflammatories, and an improvement of 16 points in the WOMAC score. So uh, very good data there. Now, this is something I wanted to bring up, even though we're focusing on knees. Uh, there's a hip unloader brace that I've been using quite a bit, and this has been somewhat of a home run. Um, not only does it treat the hip, but it also provides some compression in the pelvis as well. So for those patients that have, you know, uh, co-cominant sacroiliitis, this actually seems to work for both. So I've been using this brace after uh, my hip injections as well. And this is a, a really nice study that answered a question for me. A lot of my patients come and ask me, well, or they tell me, doc, I don't want to wear a brace because, you know, it's going to make me weaker. I'd rather just try and grind it out and, and keep my strength. But you can quote them this article that not only did it show that the unloader brace was uh, beneficial in pain and function, but it actually increased uh, muscle strength and walking capacity. So this was a really nice article that I used quite a bit to answer that, that question as to, Doc, is this brace going to make me weaker or not? All right. So in conclusion, uh, at least in the U.S. with the current guidelines, uh, allograft uh, tissues uh, should not be considered stem cell treatments. Uh, they may present viable options down the road due to their growth factor and cytokine content. However, uh, we need to process them better, and these uh, really need to be studied clinically. Um, advancements in interventional orthopedics, I think, uh, will allow uh, to improve our time to diagnoses of early cartilage problems, hopefully uh, identify risk at-risk populations early, deliver biologics more accurately, and therefore try and modify disease early. And then certainly consider treating the subchondral bone early to help modify uh, osteoarthritis prior to end-stage disease. Uh, I think intraosseous injections are, are a hot topic right now, but they certainly do need more clinical investigation. Uh, and I'm happy uh, to answer any questions at the end of the slide. So again, I want to thank AMS SM and OSER for having me. Uh, it's certainly been a pleasure. Uh, I hope everyone is staying safe out there. And thank you very much again. So if you have any questions now for uh, Dr. Mountner, please type them in and we'll address them. Uh, Wade Bennett had, has asked a question about the data for STEM and PRP for the spine. Uh, Dr. Mountner, what, what's the spine? So um, uh, someone said chat is still disabled, so, but I guess maybe now it's open. So. Um, as far as the spine goes, um, there is data out there in the spine. If you look at PRP, um, there's several studies now looking at intradiscal injection of PRP, uh, which do show uh, some benefit in, even in some randomized controlled trials. Um, there are several studies looking at uh, different forms of MSC injection into, into a disc as well. Um, the, the most well-known one was this mesoblast, which did their phase two study and showed pretty significant improvement in pain and function with people with discogenic low back pain, um, and they're getting ready to start or are starting their phase three uh, trial. Um, they have not shown significant disc regeneration, though, in their studies, even though some of their animal models and preclinical models did show that. Um, and with, you know, human, there are studies looking at fat as well as bone marrow concentrating to discs uh, showing um, improvement, but most of those have been just kind of case series and not uh, randomized trials. Um, there's also some PRP studies looking at SI joints and facet joints um, and showing some benefit there as well. I don't live in the spine world much anymore, so uh, I used to do some of those procedures. I don't anymore, so I don't know the literature as well. Um, but there are a couple of uh, pretty good um, physician stands from some of the pain and societies and biologics out there that you could look at as well for more information. Uh, Dr. Mautner, another question. Uh, do you typically do a series of... Um one shot, um, 
too many questions come in and just scroll down. Uh, do you typically do a series or one shot of PRP for NeoA? It's an excellent question. Um, and I think the data is kind of mixed out there. Um, so we typically do one injection and then we kind of evaluate where people are about two months later and the majority do not need a second or a third injection. Um, as most of you know, a lot of the early studies were all comparing uh, three PRP to three HA injections, and that's why they were doing this series of three. Um, and there's some data out there that says that, you know, having zero, one, or two doesn't make a difference. Um, but there is some data suggesting maybe two is better than one. Um, and, and so our, our protocol has been to do one, evaluate it two months later, um, and kind of decide on what percentage of folks got some response. You know, they're not a non-responder, they got some response, but may uh, get a second one and actually do better. How do you respond to those joint replacement surgeons that fail to recognize the treatment gap and that state there is a seamless transition between failed CSI and PT to total joint replacement? This is a common take in the world, in the joint replacement world. Yeah, um, that's an excellent question. Um, you know, I think we need data. I think that they're going to listen to data. Um, I think the data on PRP is pretty convincing if they actually look at it. And even our, you know, I work with a lot of surgeons at Emory, and, and they've come around to some degree on that data, at least, um, from, you know, this stuff doesn't work at all to, you know, this stuff does work with mild to moderate arthritis for, for NEOA. And so I think, you know, as we put out more data, um, we, will, we will hopefully uh, convince some of them. Um, you know, Dr. Hernigu has some studies out there where he uh, did simultaneous, you know, arthroplasty and biologic injections in, in different joints. And he showed them um, that the ones who got the biologic injection actually uh, did better um, than those who had the joint replacement. And so, you know, if they're not going to listen to data, then they're not going to listen to anything. And so I think that's our best bet. And, and you know, just to be rational and realize that, um, you know, many, many times in the course of history of, of medicine, uh, there have been um, innovations that have been laughed at um, and scoffed at, uh, such as when arthroscopy came out um, in, the, in the late uh, 70s and early 80s. Um, and, and so we just need to be persistent and patient. And uh, I think, you know, the, the, the studies and data will hopefully show that what we're doing is, is right. Thank you. Next question. Uh, do you combine injections with other modalities like knee bracing and injections? For example, unloader braces are, are definitely a part of my practice, especially when it comes to um, folks who have a unilateral unicompartmental knee problem um, and will put a biologic in their joint. And then I do like to use an unloader brace to kind of open up the joint space um, and, and, and reduce the stresses along the joint. And so I think that combination is quite um, effective along with physical therapy and a lot of other things that we preach day to day. And so um, these biologics are certainly going to be an adjunct to all the other things that we're doing for folks with, with arthritis that we treat. Things that I found in that experience was that we couldn't get any viable MSCs from uh, the commercial amniotic fluid products. And that seems to be kind of the same thing with, um, you know, cord blood products and things of that nature that in, that are here. So. Our study, it seemed that there's something happening in the cryopreservation process that may be killing the cells, or there may just not be enough cells in these uh, placental derived tissues that when you turn them into commercial products, that they become, you know, quote unquote, stem cell products. Now, I think what's, what's different with, um, you know, products outside of the US uh, is that you can actually uh, isolate those cells and then grow them out in culture and then go ahead and re-inject them to the patient. I think that's the big distinction for our audience is to know that in the in the United States, you know, we have to follow FDA guidelines. We're not able to do that. We're not able to culture cells, manipulate cells and things of that nature. So you're essentially just getting a, a product that likely doesn't have any uh, MSCs in them. Now, we did check those products for them having uh, growth factors. And we did test positive. So they're the same growth factors that are in PRP and bone marrow are present in some of these commercial products, albeit at lower rates. So it may be that there's something to this technology, but I think we need to do a better job of processing them because we're losing the cells and we're lowering the growth factor contents. Ken, is that similar to the stuff you, you've been seeing with these commercial products? 
Um, so yes, I mean, I've, I've read your study, Dr. Panera, obviously, and, and, you know, Lisa Fortier and, and other folks have done similar research and, and, you know, I mean, I agree that you can't really argue the fact that the, the true MSC population is very low in these products. Um, and there are growth factors in them, but even that has not been shown in some of these studies to be any greater, even in your study, to be any greater than, than that of, of PRP in a lot of instances. Um, and so we don't know what the efficacy is of these treatments, right? And, and I make a point to say, I'm not saying they're not effective at all. Um, and we're actually doing a, a study, a, a randomized trial with one of these companies um, to, to look at its effectiveness as well. Um, but you know, we, we often get upset about the, the mismarketing of, of these products uh, by, once again, initially it was the companies who were mismarketing, and now it's a lot of these pop-up stem cell clinics that are selling these products that, that are misrepresenting them uh, to people. Yeah, I agree. And I think that's the main take-home point, that, you know, for the audience today is those products, uh, you know, be careful about marketing them as stem cell products know what's actually within them and then just make sure you're up to date with fda guidelines because after november of 2020 we may not really even be allowed by the fda to use them so we'll have to see or kind of stay tuned on that the next part of my talk was going into you know interventional orthopedics and i know that's a passion of yours as well as mine uh one of the things kind of the hot topics right now is intraosseous injections and um you know i was going to present two uh studies that showed um, they compared doing just intra-articular PRP versus intra-articular plus intra-osseous. And there seemed to be some benefit, not initially at the one or two month mark, but at the six to seven month mark. So I've started to do some of the intra-osseous injections with PRP, or if you want to call it intra-osseous bioplasty. But I know it's still somewhat of a debatable topic. And, and I know when we spoke at IOF, uh, Jerry Malenga also felt like, you know, there's a lot uh, more research needed to be done. So what are your thoughts on the, on the intraosseous injections? So, yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the, um, a lot of the excitement about intraosseous started with Hernigou's work, which I mentioned before and looking at AVN and showing really good success. And so it got a lot of these interventional orthopedic uh, societies and, and companies and, and doctors interested in it. Um, I don't do any in my practice because I still feel like you really should use a C arm or a mini C arm to do intraosseous work and not ultrasound. Um, and a lot of doctors will point to the study that was done in Italy where they show, I think it was Italy or, or somewhere in Europe, I think it was Italy, uh, where they actually showed that um, ultrasound was as good as fluoroscopy for intraosseous injections. Um, but the doctors in that study had done thousands of fluoroscopically guided intraosseous injections before they ever started using ultrasound. So it's not like someone like me or a lot of folks here who have no experience injecting into bones with, with the C arm. And I'm not sure using ultrasound where you don't know where the stuff is going is always going to be your best bet. Um, so, and the pain is an issue too. And so not having conscious sedation and doing the, in the office, I think can be an issue because they're, they're uncomfortable. Um, and lastly, you know, uh, Dr. Centeno does have, um, it's a retrospective data, but he does have some retrospective registry data suggesting his outcome really were not better with intraosseous versus, with intraarticular uh, versus intraarticular plus intraosseous. And so I think the jury is out. Um, I think bone marrow lesions are still not very well understood and whether we need to treat them or just rest them and offload them, which is often how they, they get better anyway. Um, and so, you know, when we were at IOF, um, Alberto and others on this call, you know, about half the people in the room said they're doing some kind of intraosseous treatment. And, and I know that's where Dr. Malanga, uh, who was the president of IOF, kind of stood up and said, whoa, that, that might be a little bit more aggressive than we should be at this point. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. I think that there is some promising uh, data. I think we need to do more. And the next question is, well, how do we, you know, we rehab, right? So you do the intraosseous injection, do you put them non-wavering, do you not? The few that I've done, I've been trying to put them non-wavering, um, and I think that will transition into some of the bracing options. And then once they're wavering, I will put in a knee unloader brace. Um, and I know Oser has the unloader one, and now the unloader one X. Um, are you using unloaders after just even intra-articular injections? 
Yeah, that was that was a question that that someone had asked. Um, I think you may have been away at that point, and I was talking about you know if folks have yeah unicompartmental uh, disease, I, I do like unloaded braces, um, especially in the peri procedural realm. You know, the first four to six weeks, especially after the procedure, um, I like to get them in an unloaded brace. Um, and then beyond that, you know, I, I kind of left it up to them and their comfort in the brace. You know, as, as you know, some love it and will keep wearing it, and others, um, you know, they're. they're adherence to it diminishes over time. But I do like as the, these cells are kind of settling in that, that we have them, uh, that we have the, the joints sufficiently offloaded to some degree. Yeah, I agree. You? Uh, same thing. I've been using them for, I ask people to wear them for at least four to six weeks after I do, you know, bone marrow or, or MFAT, whatever the treatment is. Uh, as, you know, obviously if it's, if it's localized to the meter or the lateral compartment, uh, another brace I've been using quite a bit is the hip unloader brace uh, for my hip injections. And what I like about it is not only does it uh, unload the hip joint, but it also, because it provides compression to the pelvis, those folks that you know may also have some lumbar facet arthritis or even sacroiliitis, it seems to help with that. So I've been using that brace for about four to six weeks uh, after the injections. And, and, and just like you, some people love it and they'll continue wearing it um, and others will just use it for that time period. Um, and then I also take that time period to make sure that I get them through a, a guided physical therapy program. I think that that's also very important. And I think that's a, a topic for debate, right? Because there's no strict or, or uh, you know, it's very, you know, what people do for rehab is very varied. Um, is there something that you stick to or do you give your patients a protocol for rehab or? Yeah. Um, um yeah, I mean, this is an area of interest of mine. I, I've had some papers out on, on some of our rehab protocols, um, and I do think it is still an area there's not been a lot of studies looking at rehabilitation following these protocols. And so most of the um, advice we give people are based on, you know, the, the just the healing cascades of tendons or cartilage and, and how we rehabilitate other similar types of procedures. And so I do have a, I don't have a PRP and a, and a stem cell protocol. I have a, a joint protocol and a tendon protocol, regardless of the biologic that I inject. Um, I kind of keep them on similar protocols. And as many know, uh, with tendons, you know, it, it really takes six or eight weeks until we're really seeing improvement and three to six months for total improvement. And so they have a much slower progression. And whereas with joints, a lot of patients start feeling better uh, within, you know, three to four weeks. Um, and so I'm actually letting people who I just inject a knee, for example, uh, get back to activities. Um, you know, usually within a week or so, they get back to light activities. Around two weeks, uh, start to get on a bike or, or maybe a uh, um, elliptical machine. And hopefully by a month, get back to most of their activities that, as pain allows. Yeah, so I agree. I think intratendinous work, you have to be a lot more conservative. Do you use any bracing at all? Uh, for instance, when I do a patellar tendon, I'll put them in a brace and I'll lock it out at zero for a week or so and then start opening it up some. I actually, I might be too conservative, but I don't let them put weight down for a week. And then I really kind of slow, slowly get them into stuff at three to four weeks, depending on how they're doing. Um, same thing if, you know, if I do a common extensor tendon, intratendinous, I'll put a wrist brace on for a week or two just so they're not activating that tendon. Um, Achilles tendon, I'll put them in a boot. Do you, do you like to immobilize or do you just let them go? Um, yeah, that's a great question. I, I typically don't immobilize very much, only to the point that I want to protect the tendon. Um, two reasons. Number one, um, there's been data looking at animal models where they've injected, you know, like blue dye into an Achilles and then moved it all around. Um, and they've actually shown that the, the spread is not as bad as we would expect and that the substances are still staying within the tendon. Um, so people worry about the PRV escaping from the area. So I think that helps with that argument. And then two, there, there's plenty of data out there suggesting that early motion can actually aid the healing of these tendons. And so, you know, I, I do like to protect the area for two to three days. Um, if it's a lower extremity um, issue, I will offer crutches or a boot for the first few days. But I do want them to put some weight on it and to get some motion and start, you know, the kind of mechanotransduction and that cell to cell communication that I think can help the healing process. Uh, Dr. Mountner, um Thanks for sharing your info and congrats on your mild study. What is your overall feeling on the use of allergenic products? 
Um, so we talked about that and, and a little bit. Um, overall, it's a very, very, very small percentage of my practice. You know, I think the data is uh, um, not really out there in terms of using any of the birth tissue products uh, for orthopedic use. Um, I think that there is, uh, you know, as we said, they don't contain live cells. I think anytime you put a needle into a tendon, no matter what you inject, whether it's saline or amniotic tissue or uh, sugar water um, or nothing at all, there's going to be a healing response. And so, you know, showing me a, a, a lateral epicondyle study that just looks at that isn't, isn't really going to convince me that birth products are, are, are truly effective. Um, so I would put some of these products, some of the better ones that are out there, maybe on the same level of, of a PRP injection. Um, in terms of their potential effectiveness. Um, certainly, I don't think they're going to prove to be a, as good as uh, autologous cellular products. But, you know, that's why we're doing this big study, and hopefully we'll get some answers. And I, and I can tell you from the study that we're doing that if you look at the, we're not allowed to inject these birth products. Um, this umbilical cord tissue has to have at least a 70% viability, or we cannot even inject it, right? So we're not taking something off the shelf that has no cells in it. Um, we don't know what these cells are, but 70% of them or over 70% are alive and we're injected it when we're injecting them. It's a very rigorous protocol that we go through to make sure. Um, and it just shows me even more that if you don't adhere to the strict protocol, how quickly these cells die once you start thawing them out. Question for Dr. Panero. Please briefly discuss exosomes and any data uh, supporting their use for MSK pathology. Sure. So, so the way that I understand exosomes is uh, going back to the Dr. Uh, Mountner's point where Dr. Kaplan has switched from going uh, mesenchymal stem cells to medicinal signaling cells. And essentially what happens is when these cells want to communicate or, you know, signal a cell to release a certain molecule or growth factor cytokine or to differentiate, uh, the way that they uh, send those messages is with these exosomes, or maybe that's the way they do it. So essentially an exosome is a package or a message that gets uh, released by the cells, the, the host or the recipient cell, uh, endocytosis or takes that, that exosome in, and that, um, that message gets released within the cell, whether it's via mRNA, and it essentially tells a cell to do a certain function. So it, it sounds like really cool technology, but I think we're really far away from actually being able to use it. The difference is that each individual person is going to have, uh, you know, kind of a, a custom way how they're going to release messages. So it may not work for every single individual. And the reality is we just don't know exactly which which exosomes do what and how to isolate them in a perfect world where we can concentrate them and put it uh, into, a, into a patient. Um, as far as clinical data, it's very lagging. There is some animal data, but the FDA yeah. came down pretty hard on exosomes in December. Member and um, actually basically said that these are not FDA products and really recommended against using exosomes. Uh, so uh, at this point, I would recommend against uh, using it just because of the, the last FDA letter that came out in December. Another question for Dr. Panero. You discussed that there is minimal data for allergenic products, but not sure you specifically discussed Wharton's jelly that is supposed to have a good amount of MSCs. Do you find if you use Wharton's jelly along with allergenic product, there are better results? Uh, the truth is I did not study Wharton's jelly, so I didn't actually analyze it. So I would be a little bit you know, out of line to say what it has or doesn't have. What I can tell you is that when you look at culture-derived allografts, um, Wharton's jelly out of the birthright products has the best trilineage differentiation. So there, there does seem to be some evidence that out of the placental uh, derived tissues, Wharton's jelly may have the best source of MSCs. Um, I did not analyze them, at least the commercial products that are available in the US. Um, so I, I don't know, but I can tell you that outside of that, yes, Wharton's jelly may have the better MSCs that can uh, differentiate into the three lineages that you want. Ken, any comments on Warren's jelly? Um, yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I think you know that literature better than I do, but I agree that, um, you know, in theory, it, it probably is the potentially the best one. But 
Um, even that one, you know, I don't think has been shown to, to have as many cells as these folks are claiming. I, I agree, yeah. Uh, question for either, does health insurance cover PRP? Um, so the short answer is not really. Um, this year for the first time, TRICARE, um, actually, which is, as people know is a military uh, form of, of, of health insurance, um, has approved PRP for mild to moderate osteoarthritis um, and lateral epicondylopathy. Um, but it is still has to be pre-approved by them. But I've ever seen actually have a policy kind of admitting PRP. Other than that, it's been you know random. Once in a while, we'll, we'll get one approved, but not very often. Yeah, the only one I, I had approved is workers' comp, and it's only some of them, and it's kind of on a case by case basis. And primarily, they will cover for NEOA, which has level one data, and uh, lateral epicondylitis, uh, which also has some level one studies. But it's it's few and far between, and you gotta you gotta typically go through an appeal process and a review process and all that. How do you decide uh, which biologic should be used uh, with all of the choices that you have from PRP, bone marrow concentrate, et cetera? What's your uh, decision-making process? Go ahead, Alberto. So I think that it's it's pathology-based. Um, I've been, you know, because there's so much good data for PRP and NEOA, uh, I typically recommend uh, for osteoarthritis, I will go with PRP for advanced tendinopathy and partial tendon tears that have contained lesions. That's where I feel bone marrow is actually stronger. We reviewed some of our data uh, comparing our patellar tendon PRPs to bone marrow concentrate. And there seemed to be, and, uh, and this is just you know retrospective review, but almost a critical size lesion where uh, if the patellar tendon defect was 0.5 centimeters squared or greater on ultrasound, it didn't do well with PRP. Uh, and when we did bone marrow for those, they actually did much better. So um, tendon, I go with bone marrow if I can. Uh, joint, I'm still going with um, PRP, especially if it's grade three or four where we know there's not going to be restoration of uh, joint space or regrowth of cartilage. I think of points to be made, you know, for early stages of OA, maybe those are better candidates for bone marrow or MFAT uh, because you're actually trying to mitigate, um, you know, the advancement of the osteoarthritis. And, and that's kind of the way I conceptually think about it. Yeah, I, I mean, it's... Um... It, it's it's not a I don't have a cookie book answer to that. I mean, there's lots of factors that go into sure. me deciding what biologic I'm going to use, um, as well as um, what type of biologic. Meaning, if I'm going to use a MSC preparation, if I'm going to do uh, MFAT or, or bone marrow concentration, um, it's probably more complicated than than this phone than this uh, meeting. Um, but in short, you know, I do like to take people from simple to kind of more advanced procedures if I can. Lots of folks do really well with PRP who don't need more advanced procedures. Um, I try and talk people out of thinking that MSCs are a cure for their disease. Um, and, and so, although I think once you get in moderate to severe arthritis, uh, PRP probably doesn't work as well. Um, and even though you saw my data saying that MSCs may not always work, um, I do think we start to talk about a little bit more aggressive of a treatment, uh, which might involve a, a MSC type treatment. I, I think something that I've done that's helped quite a bit is really present all the options to the patients, kind of go over the benefits and risks. And obviously, they're always going to ask you, well, you know, what would you do, right? And you can give them your honest opinion. But I think it's really, like Dr. Mountain said, taking in all the factors, right? There's also going to be an invasiveness factor, a cost factor, you know, how is it going to change the rehab at all, the timing, right? So, for instance, if it's an in-season athlete or an out-of-season athlete, so there's a lot of factors, but I think it, it really starts with having that conversation early with the patient and providing all the options. Uh, for either speaker or both, uh, do you combine treatment options such as PRP and HA for knee or hip OA or 10X and PRP for tendinosis? 
Um, I, I go, I'll go first. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the data suggests, and there's a couple studies now for knee arthritis, that PRP plus HA is uh, probably better than either one alone. Um, so I do two things. One, I do combine them more often now than I did before. Um, or number two, I'll do an HA injection. Um, and then three to four weeks later, if they're not having their uh, desired level of improvement, I'll then come back and do a PRP injection. Um, that way, you know, some patients probably do fine with HA and don't need anything additional. Um, so that's what I do there. As far as 10X and PRP, um, recently in some, uh, some of my higher level athletes I've been treating, I have been combining PRP and 10X together. Um, you know, I had, I've had, you know, you get some athletes who the agents want you to do two, three PRPs in them, and I just don't think that makes a lot of sense for a tendon issue. Um, and so I have been combining uh, treatments, um, and I don't think there's a lot of data out there. The only study I know of that compares it is, is we have a, a study comparing PRP versus 10X for uh, lateral epicondylopathy and showed no difference in the outcome, you know, both of which have. Um, I think it was over 85% success rate um, in the treatment, 85 to 90%. Um, and so for most things, especially for lateral elbows, I don't think we need to, to combine them. But for really bad patella tendons or really bad Achilles tendons, uh, theoretically, I think there could be a reason to, to do them both together. Yeah, I agree. I have been, I used to do HA and then if that didn't work, move on to PRP, but based on some of the more recent data, I've been combining them. Um, I would say, you know, if you are going to combine 10X with PRP, um, especially if you're doing it you know, within a week and, and can I like to get your, your point of view on this, what I've done is so typically for tendons, I'll actually use a loop side rich PRP preparation. Uh, while if I'm already creating an inflammatory response with the tenic, I'll actually switch to leukocyte four. So that may be a consideration. Um, whether they're doing better or not, you know, I think it remains to be seen. A great lead into this next question. Do you, for both of you, do you prefer a leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor PRP? Uh, you know, thoughts from both. Uh, you know, I think the data, you know, supports using leukocyte poor for joints, for osteoarthritis. Um, and leukocyte rich, uh, for if you look at the glute tendon data, the common extensor tendon data, those typically have been done with leukocyte rich PRP preparations. And um, I think there's also the, I think we have to make it start to make a distinction as to whether it's leukocyte poor or leukocyte free PRP. And that may be another distinction that, that comes in uh, down the road. But that's the way I conceptualize it joints, leukocyte poor. Tendons, rich. Uh, same question, Dr. Mautner. Yeah. Leukocyte rich or leukocyte poor? Which Hi, Dr. Griffin. Oh, hold on, give me just a second. Technology here. Um, hold on, just a second. Um, That's okay. We can. Um, if you want to mute your mic, Dr. Mautner, we'll go on with another question. Sure. Uh, Dr. Panero, what do you feel about nerve ablation for knee OA pain? You know, I've done quite a few of them now. Um, I've actually gotten the best results out of the procedure for patients who've had already had a knee replacement and are still having pain after their knee replacement. I've had the most success in those patients with radiofrequency ablation. Uh, with um, with uh, patients that don't that still have their their original knee. It's been somewhat hit or miss. I, I would say that most people are happy with it. It is somewhat of a painful procedure. So I, I've been doing them all under conscious sedation under uh, fluoroscopy, and I take them to a surgical center to do it. I think there are some billing issues trying to do those genicular blocks in the office with ultrasound. Uh, so I would make people aware of that. But I think it's, it's another option. It's another tool that you have in your box. And uh, for patients who cannot afford PRP, they've already failed. Uh, hyaluronic acid and just can't have any replacement. It's certainly a, a good option to, to provide for them. All right. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to get a telemedicine patient started uh, while trying to finish this chat up. And so uh, that's really fun around here. Um, I do want to go back, though, and, and talk about this leukocyte rich and leukocyte poor uh, topic because um, you're right. All, all the, and, and I have a paper coming out on this, but all the data suggests um, for tendon leukocyte rich is is more beneficial, but 
but that's really because that's what the studies have been done on. But I think if you look at sure. some basic science, uh, leukocyte poor PRP uh, may actually have better proliferation of tenocytes uh, than leukocyte rich does. And so once again, it's it's what Dr. Panera said is, if, you know, neutrophils aren't good for tendons either. And so, you know, if, if you can get rid of neutrophils um, and inject um, um, a higher concentration of platelets in the tendons, uh, so not really ACP, but, you know, getting up to that five to seven X with your platelet concentration um, and not have the, the neutrophils, not have the red blood cells. Um, I think that's going to be your best product, even for tendons as well. A couple um, closing comments from, uh, yes, Dr. Mountner. Oh, or, nope. Go ahead. A couple Sorry. closing comments from um, each of you, uh, Dr. Panero. I think the key point number one is to make sure if, you know, reps come into your office looking at allograft tissues make sure you really look at the basic science behind them and know that at least as of right now we don't have uh they shouldn't be considered quote unquote stem cell products two i think that there's some um interesting options that are going to be coming down the line with uh you know interventional orthopedic procedures i think we have to look closer at treating bone marrow lesions maybe earlier before they allow the joint to progress um, even looking at things at needle arthroscopy, which is still very early in, in, in the data, uh, but it may help to look at cartilage injuries earlier and even do follow-ups after you do the injections. And lastly, don't just inject and leave it alone. Make sure you know that you have some sort of rehab protocol that you're going to follow. Uh, and I highly recommend using the unloader uh, brace, whether it's the hip or the knee, for four to six weeks after the procedure. So, um, you know, my comments, um, first of all, thank you for OSER and AMSSM for setting this up. And, you know, I think that we are truly on the cusp of, of, uh, of a revolution or an evolution of how we treat musculoskeletal conditions. And we're very early on on that cusp. Um, and so at the same time as I and, and a lot of us have excitement about the field, um, I really think as uh, sports medicine physicians, uh, we need to be very conscientious providers of this uh, technology, um, and you know that we're. I'm afraid of the you know the the, the bathwater being thrown out with the bath, or the bath with the bathwater, in terms of the fact that you have all these pop-up clinics all around the country that are marketing these things aggressively, and you know we don't want to be lumped in with them, and so we want to make sure that we are are providing a conscientious, evidence-based medicine where there is evidence and just allowing patients and us to make you know informed decisions about their best treatment options um and i think if we all kind of keep that in mind and, and try to uh, um, be you know good clinicians like we are um that we'll continue to, to expand the field great thank you both and thank you to amssm i feel this has been tremendous this will be posted on the amssm website so you will have access to this on your society um, website for, uh, I believe, through the next, uh, the rest of the year. We will be doing these again. I think just the discussion that um, that that happened and the back and forth and your questions were fabulous. Um, it yeah. felt really good. We'd love your feedback. 